What up, fam? Welcome to Skill Tree, where we learn how to do just about everything. So, with the pandemic apparently at our doorstep here, um, I figured now would be a really good time to kind of address this whole thing, the fear surrounding it, and what you can do to kind of give you some of that power back. I debated whether or not to kind of make this episode. I'm sure you're sick of hearing it by now. I mean, it it's dominating the news cycle and every conversation you have, I, I almost guarantee has to do with the coronavirus at this point. That being said, I am a strong believer that the best remedy for fear is knowledge. So that's what I aim to do today. Um, I've taken a lot of time to research not just coronavirus, but viruses in general. So on this episode, we're going to learn how this sucker works, what you can do to protect yourself, and if you do get infected, what that means for you. I'm also going to talk a little bit about how learning how to make this plague mask might actually help you stay healthy. Now I'm gonna add steps in the description if you kinda wanna jump around, but I do advise you watch the whole thing. Um, honestly, learning how this stuff works and how it's actually spread is gonna go a long way in keeping you safe and making sure that if you do catch it, you don't spread it to the people around you. So without much further ado, let's stay healthy and level up this skill. Virology. In the seminal strategic classic, The Art of War, Sun Tzu wrote, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. To that end, let's get to know our enemy and delve into exactly how a virus works. So your body is made up of a bunch of self-contained organisms called cells. Within a cell is all the biological machinery needed to eat, grow, and replicate itself. A virus, on the other hand, has none of this equipment. At their center, they consist of a nucleic acid, which is either DNA or RNA. This acts as a kind of genetic instruction manual. These instructions are coated in a layer of protein called the capsid. Some, such as the influenza virus and the coronavirus, have an outer lipid layer as well. A lipid is just basically a fat. And this is really important to remember, actually, for later on when we're learning how to prevent ourselves from getting sick, remember that it's covered in that lipid layer. Now, by itself, a virus is completely incapable of replicating and proliferating. Because of this, it really toes the line as to whether it actually can be considered a living organism or not. Nope, like any good parasite, these little bastards need a host in order to reproduce. So let's say your boy Clever happens to come in contact with the virus and it manages to make its way into my squishy parts. The first order of business for this malicious stowaway is to find the right kind of cell. It turns out viruses are very specific to the kinds of cells they can attack. So all cells have these little specialized receptors that only allow certain things to connect to them. Certain viruses have managed to evolve to be able to match those points exactly. That being said, again, they need to match exactly to the right kind of cell for them. So once the desired cell is located, the virus will bind to that cell and insert its genetic instructions inside. The infected cell then reads those instructions and starts producing the materials needed to assemble more viruses. In a nutshell, the virus hijacks that cell's mechanisms that it uses to make reproductions of itself in order to make reproductions of the virus instead. And that one single infected cell can make millions of copies of that virus before it finally dies. These virus copies can then either attack additional cells in the bodies to make even more of themselves or hitch a ride outside of the body on droplets of spit when you sneeze or cough. Those escape copies are now ready to try to find another host to start this over again, i.e. the poor guy on the train in front of you. This is how a virus replicates and jumps from host to host. And this is also going to be really important when we're learning how to kind of beat this thing is the fact that it needs a host. If it doesn't have a host, it cannot replicate itself. Cool. So now that we know the bare basics of how a virus works, let's learn the specifics of COVID-19. COVID-19 is a novel strand of the coronavirus. It's a novel strand because it's a new version of an already known virus. There's actually a bunch of viruses that fall under the umbrella term of coronavirus. I'll name such because their outer membrane looks like a corona, which is like a crown-like protrusion. Think of if you look at like the rays of a sun, those little rays coming off, that's called a corona. Now, most types of coronavirus are relatively harmless. Odds are you might've already had a version of the coronavirus because it is one of the viruses that cause what we consider to be the common cold. That being said, there are more dangerous varieties of it. The two more popular in the past would have been SARS and MERS. Now, like all other coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, COVID-19 that we're facing right now all affect the upper respiratory system. These ones, uh, and especially this one right now, seems to be more severe to us though because it's new for us. We don't have any immunities to deal with it currently. You see, these types of viruses typically affect other animals like birds, bats, and pigs. 
In fact, this strand we're dealing with right now um, is genetically linked back to bats. They think there was an intermediary animal, so it went from bats to some other animal to humans. And that's what viruses do. Over time, they mutate, and every once in a while, one mutates just enough to allow it to infect a host that it couldn't infect before. And let me take a, a little quick tangent on this one and make sure we remember that too. Um, this is what viruses do, blaming the area that it came from, blaming the people who are the victims of this, the initial victims of this, that isn't helpful at all. This, this is just what viruses do. They, they learn and they jump into a, a new host. Um, these are particular strand of viruses that we have been affected by before. So it's not even the first time this kind of virus has jumped to a human host. This is just one that is super novel for us and we're just having trouble getting our hands around. And regardless of the path it took to get to us, it's with us now and because it's our first run in with it, it's having some pretty dire consequences. Now, just as discussed before though, it's a virus and it has the same makeup, you know, anatomy of a virus. At its center, it has its single strand of code, which is RNA, surrounded by a capsid of protein and an outer lipid envelope. Once it locates its desired cells, which is in your respiratory system, those little protein protuberant that make it look like a corona bind to the cell. That lipid layer on the outside of it then fuses to your cell's lipid layer and slowly absorbs the virus into your cell. Then it releases those genetic instructions into the cell and the cell does what a cell does and replicates. Now, as those cells start to die and your body starts to realize kind of there's a foreign body in here, you're gonna get an immuno response. An immuno response usually consists of, you know, you're gonna have a fever, that's when you're gonna to start to produce a lot more mucus or you're coughing and sneezing, which is exactly what the little bastard wants, right? Like, uh, it's a terrible thing, but it's really elegant when you think of the design of it. It makes you have a reaction that will expel it into the air and thus infect more people. Kind of impressive. Now in extreme, extreme cases, um, the buildup of those dying cells and also your body's hyper immuno response um, can start to fill your lungs with liquid, basically causing pneumonia. That being said, the current statistics right now, and, and these things can change, right now I'm filming this, it is March 15th, 80% um, of the people who will contract this virus will show mild symptoms. Basically your flu-like symptoms, right? You're gonna get a fever, you're gonna feel like hell for a week, um, they'll be sneezing, coughing, all of that going on, but it's not gonna be so bad that you need hospitalization. Definitely something you can weather out at home. So that remaining 19% may present more severe symptoms pneumonia, difficulty breathing, um, a lot of just respiratory distress. Now that doesn't mean that 19% of it is fatal. It actually is showing currently a fatality rate of about 2.3%. So even those that kind of fall into the more kind of moderately severe issue there, it's still a very small percentage that, that actually end up being fatal. And that number may even be smaller because currently we don't have very good methods of testing. So there might be a lot of people who have it, who just kind of feel under the weather and don't go into the hospital to get checked. And even if they did, there's no real way to tell if that's the case. So that's gonna skew the numbers to seem a lot higher. That being said, it is our social responsibility to protect those of us who are at their weakest. So to that end, now that we know how our enemy works, it's time to move on to defense. Okay, so as we go over the different ways to protect yourself from the coronavirus, there's, there's kind of two methods of defense I want you to think of here. The first is, of course, protecting yourself from infection. The second, though, is the social responsibility we have to protect those around us. And that second one is super important because, as I said, 81% of us who get infected are going to be just fine. But that being said, uh, with the statistics the way they are right now, 2.3% of us are in a bit of trouble. Thus, it is the responsibility of all of us to mitigate that spread as much as possible. Here's how. First things first, it's the buzzword all over the news, social distancing. This is just basically trying to avoid crowded places as much as possible. As we discussed before, it's a virus. It needs a host in order to proliferate. If we starve it of those hosts, that's when this thing's gonna start to die down and become manageable. So to that end, now is a great time to kind of just stay home, right? It's springtime, you can get some spring cleaning done. Um, there's a lot of things you could do at home. It basically amounts to just kind of stay home as much as you can, stay indoors, stay away from a bunch of people, don't get on trains, don't get on planes, don't get anywhere crowded. And if you do go out, it's recommended that you maintain a distance from other people of six to 10 feet. This way, if they are infected and they do cough or sneeze or whatever, it's gonna be harder for that, that loose spit and viruses to actually reach you and make it to the parts that it can infect. And there's also the social responsibility to it. That's that second form of defense, right? If you are sick and the projections right now show that 
most of us are gonna come in contact with this at some point. If you are sick, you especially, stay home. It's your responsibility to, to take it and imprison it in your body, imprison it in your space and let it starve to death. Don't let it find another host. You are an integral part at that point of making sure it dies on the vine. All right, next up is washing your hands. And you've probably heard this everywhere right now. Um, like Purell hand sanitizer is in super high demand and they absolutely do work. But you know what works better? Simple hand soap, hand soap and water. So rewinding back a little bit, remember how I told you that the COVID-19 is surrounded by that lipid layer, that layer of fat? So soap is really interesting. If you look at soap, it has two ends to it. One end loves water and the other end loves fats. So what happens is that end that loves fats, that likes lipids, will bond to the outer wall of that virus. Now that lipid wall is actually not held together very firmly. The bonds there are very weak. So the part of the soap that likes water begins to pull it apart. Regular hand soap that we've been using for thousands of years will actually rip this virus to pieces. And even the particularly strong little bastards that don't get ripped to pieces um, are now locked in suspension inside the soap and can easily be washed away once you rinse your hands. Honestly, soap is the best thing you can do, but there is a method to it. It takes about 20 seconds of you scrubbing your hands in order for the soap to have a chance to rip those bonds apart. And just so you know, 20 seconds is how long it takes to sing the happy birthday song twice and not speeding through it. Give it some gumption. This is somebody who likes birthday. You're not like, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. Sing the song. Also, you wanna make sure you wash all surfaces of your hands. So start by wetting your hands. Then add the soap. Next, rub your palms together. Now rub the back of your hands and in between your fingers on both hands. Next, rub the front of your hands, again lacing your fingers together to make sure you're getting in between them. Clasp your fingers together and rub to get the back of your fingernails. Then get underneath your nails by scrubbing your fingertips against your palms. After that, scrub each thumb individually before finishing up by moving on to your wrists. Once you're done, rinse it all away. Grab a clean paper towel to dry your hands and use that paper towel to shut the faucet off and open whatever door you're leaving through. And that is the CDC approved way of washing your hands. And again, by doing this, you are going to actually kill the virus. The hand sanitizer is more of a stopgap. So if you're in an area that doesn't have a sink readily available, or you don't have kind of a soap set up, you can use it to get you to the next spot, but you really should wash your hands with soap. It's really what's gonna do the trick. Now, speaking of your hands, and I'm sure you've heard this one before, keep them off of your face. So remember how I said that viruses are very specific as to what cells they can go after? In order for COVID-19 to affect you, it has to either get into your nose, eyes, or mouth. So if you've touched a surface at all anywhere, and then you touch your face, you're bringing that closer to those little areas. You're basically opening up the door and inviting the little sucker in. And should you already be infected, again, it's your responsibility, don't touch your face because that's also where the virus comes out from. So you touch your face or you cough in your hand or whatever, you now have contagious little mitts that you're sticking everywhere. If you have to sneeze or cough, either do it into a rag that you then throw away or do it right into the crook of your elbow. You can also employ those little face masks if you're already sick because if you cough or you sneeze, things are gonna kind of get caught up in that mask. But if you aren't sick, those masks aren't effective in protecting you. There are gaps kind of in the top and the side for the virus to get through. And also it can just get in through your eyes as well. So it's not particularly effective for stopping you from getting it, but it is fairly effective from stopping you from spreading it. And that's what I've been able to glean so far from my research into this thing. My main point of emphasis here though, is everybody just kind of needs to stay calm. I know this all seems really scary um, and the 24 hour news cycle around it and everything that's happening, uh, things closing down, uh, it's, it is, it's scary, it is. I mean, you know, when you have schools and sports shutting down, um, I think these type of things are such like a bedrock to our society. They're, they're always constant and it usually takes a really catastrophic event for us to start closing stuff like that down. So this can all feel very apocalyptic very fast. But understand, just like we were talking here, what, what the government's trying to do, what people are trying to do is to have that social distancing, right? We're trying to starve this thing. So when you see things like that closing down, it's not so much that, you know, it's such an epic catastrophe. It's that we're stopping it from being an epic catastrophe. By having that distance, it's the safest thing people can do to make sure it doesn't have more hosts to spread to. 
And this is a precautionary measure to protect that 2.3%, right? To protect those who are already in a weakened state, if they're elderly, um, if they're immunocompromised, those are the people that we're trying to protect with this. Again, for the majority of us, if we do catch it, um, we're going to be okay. We're gonna feel like hell for a little bit, but we're gonna be okay. I guess my hope here was that if it's demystified a little bit, um, maybe some of the panic will go away. Like you see people fighting each other over toilet paper. Guys, it's a respiratory disease. Toiletry needs don't even come into play here. And if they do, you can still order it. I mean, you can have it delivered to your door with Amazon or a myriad of other delivery services. And it's like the least of the concerns. There's a bunch of other ways to take care of that situation without toilet paper. I just think things like that are a symptom of the kind of fear we have though. At the beginning, we weren't being told a hell of a lot about what's happening. Things all of a sudden start to shut down. Um, people are kind of unsure as to how to protect themselves. So you latch onto these things that you think you need that might keep you safe or, or give you that comfort. And it just comes down to kind of the human need of being in control of a seemingly uncontrollable situation. Nobody likes to feel helpless. And again, you aren't helpless. All of these things that we talked about here today um, can greaten your chances of not ever becoming infected. If you're really nervous about it, stay home, avoid social interaction. Um, there's no way for the virus to jump to at that point, right? But just remember that we as a human species has earned the right to live on this planet by weathering these kind of storms. You are here because some relative earlier down the line got the flu, developed immunities, and it's no longer a total killer if you get one. Now we just kind of complain like, oh, we got the flu. And I'm not at all trying to belittle the gravity of the situation. Again, for 2.3% of our population, um, this could have really dire consequences. I just think that if we look at this through a lens of what power do we have in the situation, what our responsibility is here, um, we can then kind of take some of that power back. So I know it's hard, but just try your best to remain calm. Um, you know, again, do things around your house that bring you joy, that are things that you wanna do, which is where learning how to make this plague mask might actually help keep you safe. Because if you're home leveling up your leather crafting skills, you're not out and about potentially getting this virus. So go through this channel and see all these different skills that we've learned here, or go through other YouTube channels. There's so many kind of fun how-to things. Um, you can learn a skill, take this time to do the things that you didn't have time to do before. For once, people aren't gonna give you help or just kind of staying home and doing the things you wanna do. It doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. You can take this time for yourself. Keep yourself safe, keep your family safe, and learn some interesting things. That's it for me. If you are one of my subscribers, I know this episode was really early in the week. I just thought it'd be better to get this kind of information out. I know there's been a lot of fear surrounding it. Rest assured though, there's gonna be plenty more projects coming up soon. In the meantime, stay safe, stay calm, and keep leveling up, you.